We are... Believe it or not, we are close to the end of the book of Joshua. We are have moved all the way through. We are in chapters 20 and 21 today. We're nearing the end. Next week, we're going to be brought to the brink of civil war. So yeah, you want to check back in for that. Uh, and then we're going to hear Joshua's farewell the, the week after that. And, and it's going to take us all the way up to Easter. The last seven chapters, as Andy had covered the last couple of weeks, we have the tribes and they're receiving their land. They go in, they take the land just as God promised. There's some miracles, there's some battles, and you're talking years of battle. And then finally, what was prescribed is finally happening. Like the Christmas of all Christmases, the anticipation that, can I open the present? Can I open the present? Do we finally get the promised land that we kept hearing about? And tribe after tribe is walking up. What do we get? You get this land. What do we get? We get this land. 40 years of being in the desert and hearing about this promised land, this land that is flowing with milk and honey, and all those what ifs we get the land are becoming the right now. The emotion of years of hard work are are finally paying off. And you got to think like Super Bowl, like I get to hold the trophy and it's mine or getting that gold medal. The one days have become two day. And for seven chapters, you have borders being drawn. This tribe getting this land, that tribe getting that land that land. If I was there, I'd be like oceanfront property, oceanfront property. And they'd probably give me like a broccoli field or something, but it would still be better than having any other land. And can you imagine finally being given your land that you get to live in and farm and rest and it be yours? I mean, the conversations had to be going around. What are you going to do with your land when you get it? And we've all done it. If you won the lottery, right? What would you do with that money? And everyone is having these conversations, and they're excited. Except so far, if you've, if you've read back, because we didn't cover it verse by verse, but if you read the last seven chapters, you'll notice that 11 tribes have come up. But if you know about how many tribes there are, there are 12, which means there's one more left. And so naturally, we get to Joshua 20, and you're like, all right, 11 of the 12, what comes next? 12 of 12, the last tribe, right? Wrong. There's a, if, you, if you're counting, you're like, wait, what about the, oh, yeah, yeah we'll get there? Okay, cool, N- no big deal. Scripture moves right from 11 tribes into something else, something that's really important, but I didn't want to move to that important thing until we recognize that there's like this pause button. While 11 of the 12 tribes are holding on to their new deeds of trust and can't wait to get to their land, it's like God pauses and he gives instructions about the land. And everyone surely would have noticed this pause. And so we're going to jump in and hear then what happens uh, with these last couple chapters and with this last group of people in the land. Joshua 20, and again, I encourage you to follow along on your app or having your Bibles open. If you want to take notes or something, you can do both either in your Bible or in the app. It says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses. So you have 11 of the 12 tribes come up, and then all of a sudden, you know, the 12th tribe might be standing there, and they're like, all right, and next, let me tell you about the cities of refuge. And I almost picture the 12th tribe being like, ooh, awkward, my bad. Like if I was like, I'd like to introduce my best friend, and then Andy steps up, and I'm like, Stephen. And Andy's like, ooh, ooh, I know he's only been here one-fifth the time, but yeah, yeah, sure, sure. At least that's how I read it. That's probably not exactly how they felt it, but it's, it's, it's noticeable. Then in verses 3 through 6, we get this explanation of what a city of refuge is. This is God's like first major instruction on what to do with the land. Verse 3, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally, unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. That's such a crazy title. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. If the, avenger of blood, if the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice of forethought. God's establishing how he wants the people to live, how he wants them to live differently than the people that were before them that kind of just killed for any old reason. Worship of God, let's kill someone. You know, because I feel like it, let's kill someone. They have what I like, let's kill someone. And God's establishing a new way that the people in this land will live, to be a people of truth that value justice. 
to be done with something called blood feuds, which exists to this day. If you've ever heard of gang wars, it's blood feuds. It's you killed my friend. I'm going to kill one of yours. These things can last for generations. And they're done with revenge and anger and retribution. And they can last sometimes hundreds of years, history records. What is it, the Hatfields and McCoys? Have you ever heard that? But God wants something different. He wants leaders to lead, to follow him, working. He wants to work through godly people, elders, leaders, judges, people trying to seek his will. This is going to be a new way to live in the land. And to be clear, this this concept was no surprise to the Jewish people. They're not hearing this for the first time. They were told, in fact, back in Deuteronomy, back when Moses was still around, that once they were given this land, this is how they're going to live in these cities of refuge. So this isn't new. This is the reminder. Here's what you're going to do now. Remember, I promised you, and now you're going to promise me. And we're gonna, We get even more details about these cities, which I, I kind of love the details, back in Deuteronomy. So in your notes, you're going to see us jumping back and forth because we get more of a picture of what these cities of refuge and details about them when we jump back to Deuteronomy 19. Deuteronomy 19, 1 says, When the Lord your God has destroyed the nations whose land he is giving you, then set aside for yourselves three cities. How many cities? Three. That's important. You'll see why here in a few minutes. Set aside for yourselves three cities in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to, to possess. Determine the distance involved and divide into three parts the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance so that a person who kills someone may flee for refuge to one of these cities. We see that God values life. Even back in the Old Testament, when, when we're busy looking at all the death, God's like, no, don't blame me for all the death that sinners cause. When I'm followed and listened to, I don't kill willy-nilly. In fact, I value life. It's you guys that don't value life. And he values especially innocent life. He's saying that not all death is intentional. And these blood feuds that are rooted in anger and retribution, they're not good. So what do you do if an accidental death occurs? These aren't rich nations or people. I mean, we live in a world where now we have like at least homeowners association or like car insurance, uh, homeowners, homeowners insurance is what a homeowners association is like way different than insurance. You have homeowners insurance and you have uh, car insurance so that God forbid something bad happens. You at least have the backing. You shouldn't lose everything you, you own because of that, but you don't have that back then. If you lose a male in your family, especially a patriarchal male, you might be bankrupt. How do you make up for that? What do you do? If you just go kill another male uh, in their family, now you're going to create this blood feud. So God wants three cities, and he tells them to determine their distances because he wants them spaced so that virtually anyone, they want some space out so virtually anyone can be no more than about a day's journey to get to safety. It's important to God that anyone who needs safety and wants refuge can get it quickly. Not set out on this long journey to find safety, but you turn quickly, you can find safety quickly. And again, we see in the next set of verses in Deuteronomy some more details. Verse 4. This is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees for safety. Anyone who kills a neighbor unintentionally, without malice or forethought, for instance, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I chuckle when I read this. For instance, a man may go into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, and as he swings his axe to fell a tree, the head may fly off and hit his neighbor and kill him. Okay, that's oddly specific. I'm just throwing that out there. That's kind of like when your kid walks in. So dad, I, you know, just hypothetically speaking, what would you do if like, I don't know, like a bike ran down the side of your new car and put a scratch? I'm not saying uh, <laughs> hypothetical, right? You're like, what happened? Who did it? Oh, my sister did it, you know? But this is really specific. But when you think about it, th these aren't like axes bought at Lowe's, you know, that have like, that, that are super industrial, that are strong with glue. Like, this could happen. They don't have cars. For us, it'd be like you're going down the road and you hit someone on accident. For them, you have lots of people building lots of things, lots of times, and an axe handle really could, or an axe head could fly off and harm someone. That man may flee to one of these cities and save his life. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue him in a rage, overtake him if the distance is too great, and kill him even though he is not deserving of death. Since he he did it to his neighbor without malice aforethought. This is why I command you to set aside for yourselves three cities. 
And then back to Joshua, we get a cool detail, and I think it's a bit of a Jesus sighting. Again, if, if you can't see Jesus in the Old Testament, you're either not looking hard enough or, or you, you don't realize that he's there everywhere. And so it's good just to see, or take, at least pause and take a look. Do we see Jesus here? And I believe that we do here in Joshua 20, verse 6. They are to stay in that city until they have stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who was serving at that time. Then they may go back to their own home. Sorry, then they may go back to their own home in the town from which they fled. And so a person can go to this city, they can they can seek refuge, and then one of a few things happens. They stand trial and they're either found guilty or they're found innocent of malice. And it's important to note that if they're guilty, they're not protected. In fact, they're handed back to whatever town they came from. But two, after the trial, did you notice how long that they need to stay there and when they can finally return home? It's when the high priest, what? Dies. It's when the high priest dies. Verse six, the death of the high priest who was serving at that time. A person could return home after the high priest dies. And so if we unpack that just a little bit. The city of refuge is where people could come to for safety. But what if that person decided to leave? They come there for safety. A month goes by and they're like, I want to leave. Could they leave? Yeah, they actually could. But once they're out of that city of refuge, guess what could happen? The avenger of blood could find them and kill them. And it would be perfectly legal. And why is this location so important? Couldn't God just say, hey, look, I'm going to tell you all, in all of the land, don't kill each other. Don't take avenge and be, or, uh, become an avenger of blood. Well, he could have done that, but again, it was a different time in a different culture with different resources than what we have now. And plus, it sends a message, a message that God has been sending throughout all of time, that there is a way to seek refuge. You have to come and do things God's way. You can't expect to be saved on your terms. We're good at that as humans. Well, why wouldn't God just, and God's like, I don't know, because I'm God, and your brain is a little smaller than mine, and you see far less than I see. And don't fool yourself by thinking you're somehow more loving and gracious and kind and more all-knowing than me. Trust me in my ways. God wants us to submit to him and take refuge in him. There's this constant theme in Scripture, God's people in God's place under God's rule, ways, and blessing. It was a series that we did a while back. We see it in, way in the Old Testament in places like Noah's Ark. There's going to be a flood. What do we do? You take refuge in the Ark. You come to the Ark, and he'll save you. We see it with Jesus, right? We're all doomed for hell. How do we be saved? We come take refuge in Jesus to be saved, we need to take refuge and find safety. So that city that a person would run to for safety would both be refuge and kind of a prison. Because if you leave, you could what? Die. But if you stay there, you're safe. And it reminds me of what Amanda was saying just a few minutes ago. It, it feels like a double edged or it feels just like um, it could be a blessing and a curse it reminds me of the verses where we're called slaves to Christ. And those aren't warm and fuzzy words, being a slave to anything. But we need to remember that being a slave to righteousness, a slave to Christ, means being treated better than and cared for way more than if we were kings in this world. Belonging to Christ is always going to give us a better life. If you walk out from under the protection of God's rule. If we walk out from under the umbrella that he's given us and we go into the rain and we turn back like, why am I getting wet? God, you're making me wet. And he goes, no, I'm providing a way for you to come and stay dry, to not pollute yourself with the world. I'm providing you a refuge. You're choosing to walk out of it. And God has this theme of refuge throughout scripture and the person fleeing would be deemed fully forgiven and free when the death of the high priest occurred. They could go home. And to connect the dots, Jesus is our high priest, if you've not heard him being called that. They're excited. We take refuge in Jesus. And upon his death, we, anyone who makes him Lord, is forgiven and free. 
It's this beautiful scarlet cord throughout the Bible of seeing how God redeems and saves his people. Okay, we have two last cool things to notice about these cities of refuge that I, I really like before we get to this last tribe. And they segue nicely. How many cities of refuge were they to make? Do you remember? Three. I didn't even need to hold up my fingers. That's great. Three cities of refuge. But I want you to count how many they actually made. I'm just going to list them for time's sake, but you can read them in Joshua chapter 20, verses 7 through 8. You can see them. They're, they're spelled out where they go, but I'm going to list the city names, and so you count them. Verse 7, it starts, so they set apart Kadesh, Shechem, Kiriath, Arba, that's Hebron, and then on the other side of the Jordan, okay, where they came from, they have Bazir, Ramoth, and Golan. Okay, how, bean counters, how many was that? Six, okay, that was six. It might have sounded like seven, but they have six, twice as many. Are they being disobedient? No. In fact, we're going to check back in Deuteronomy 19.8 to see why they did this. Verse 8 says, If the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he promised an oath to your ancestors and gives you the whole land he promised them. A lot of times, you see this word promised, promised, promised. And God says, promise kept. And gives you the whole land he promised them because you carefully follow all these laws I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk always in obedience to him. Then you are to set aside three more cities. Why are they doing three more cities? Because God fulfilled his promise to give them more land. So they're going to fulfill what he told them to do and give them three more cities. It's a beautiful picture of a promise-keeping God and, and, and being obeyed by people who love him and want to be in relationship with him. They're setting aside their resources. This wasn't easy to make cities of refuge because they needed to take care of people who didn't bring anything with them except their accusations about them. They set aside resources that those people could be blessed by God from others. And we see this soon-to-be blessing when people come to the cities. We see it in the last verses for sure in Joshua 20, verse 9. It says, any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities. Any foreigner even. And this wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was for anyone. God is a God of all people. He created all. He loves all. And he wants to teach and bless all all. And he has this habit of using a chosen people to bless others through. Sojourners, people passing through, foreigners to these godly people could be blessed by and learn about this Yahweh God that these Jewish people kept going on about. And they would live truthful and fair and loving lives, valuing life and giving of themselves to care for others that they didn't even know because they were listening to a God that told them to do so. They would live and look differently than the people that had lived in the land before them. They would be a blessing to the people and to the land. And that should also define a Christ follower as well. Okay, so with our final moments... I want to ask about this last tribe. I kind of geek out as this week I was preparing. I was like, oh, it's such a beautiful picture. Do we find out about their land? Why do we have to wait? And you might already know the story. You might already know the people. But I, I, you almost ask if you're reading it for the first time, are they going to get more than everyone else? Is God saving the best for last? Well, yes and no. Reading Joshua 21, we might miss the subtle details. It sounds like they get land, but guess what? They don't. Joshua 21. Now the family heads of the Levites, there's our people. Now the family heads of the Levites approached Eleazar the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the heads of the other tribal families of Israel at Shiloh and Canaan and said to them, the Lord commanded through Moses that you give us towns to live in with pasture lands for our livestock. So as the Lord had commanded, the Israelites gave the Levites the following towns and pasture lands out of their own inheritance. Now just reading a couple of these verses uh, about these Levite clans, we can see what's happening here. 
I'll read you verses 6 and 7 just so you can kind of hear what happens for most of the book of, or most of the chapter 21 of, of Joshua. It says, The descendants of Gershon, that's Levite clan, were allotted 13 towns from the clans of the tribes of Issachar, Asher, Nephtali, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and Bashan. The descendants of Merari, another Levite clan, according to their clans, received 12 towns from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Zebulun. And so we get these other names like Issachar, Asher, Naphtali. And if you're reading it, you're like, yeah, it sounds like they're being given land. No, they're not. They're being told, hey, you know your brothers and sister tribes, other Jewish people? You're not getting land. You get to go live in their land. And they're getting doled out, if you will, to all the land and getting sprinkled everywhere. The last seven chapters, 13 through 19 roughly, it reads like this. From this rock to this landmark to here to there, that's yours. And then from this beach to that tree by the cliff, this is yours. It reads like title property. It's it's boring. You're like, oh man, okay, if you ever read your title property uh, description, it reads like that. The last seven chapters, they're excited. Okay, okay. And so it it reads like that. But all of a sudden, this language is very different. It's you're going to go now live in the towns of. It it would be like going and turning in your winning lottery ticket and say, I won the lottery. And they're like, great. You get to go live in the city with the former lottery winner and just be blessed by them. I don't get any money. No, 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 no. But you get to live near the money. What a blessing. (laughs) Like, wait a minute. Why, Why is this? Now, if, you've, if, you, if you're reading the Bible for the first time, it could be a little confusing. You're like, yeah, why aren't they getting it? I'm just confused. What, what's different about these Levites? But it's important to know this wouldn't be a surprise to them. This isn't the first time that they're hearing about it. In fact, they weren't even expecting land. Everyone knew the Levite story back then. And it was even told again back in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18 specifically, what was going to happen Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 2 says the Levitical priests, they're priests. Indeed, the whole tribe of Levi are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They shall live on the food offerings presented to the Lord, for that is their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their fellow Israelites. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. They don't get land They get the Lord. Now, I I confess, at first, especially as a kid, you're like, gee, thanks. Like like when everyone in class, the teacher's handing out cake, and they hand you carrots. And you're like, oh, what's this? Oh, Nikki, you're going to love that you ate carrots growing up. Those are healthy for you. That's a good choice for you. But they have cake. It's hard not to look around. But then as you get older and more mature, you start to realize, like, especially at least for me during Christmas time, and you get clothes. When you're younger, you're like, clothes, where's the toys? But you know, at least at least for me personally, I love when my wife and my mom to this day buy me clothes. I'm like, why do they look so much better when you buy them for me? And you appreciate that gift that keeps on giving and something that's actually more valuable. And so these people, these Levites, as they're told, that they're promised that they don't get land, but the Lord will be their inheritance. This meant something super deep. They weren't just priests. This group of people have a story where they weren't always priests, and their story wasn't always good. And it goes back quite a ways. In fact, it goes back all the way to Genesis. A quick recap. There was a man named Jacob. That's where we get the name Israel. God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And it's all his kids that make up the tribes and all those descendants. It's literally where Israel comes from. And he has all these kids in in, uh, chapter 34 of Genesis, which we did cover in the book of Genesis. Uh, I believe you can find those sermons uh, online. And it would be good because this is a controversial chapter that I'm not going to get into because Jacob has a daughter. Now, daughter is out. She gets raped by someone else from a different, uh, from foreign people. And she, obviously horrible. And then that man who does that actually likes her. And is like, I really want to marry her. Hey, dad, can we arrange something with, uh, you know, her father? Maybe like do this marriage. And Jacob, whose daughter was horribly mistreated, actually considers it. And he's like, yeah, I tell you what, if your whole clan gets circumcised, 
uh, which that's a crazy thing. But if your whole clan, your whole city gets circumcised, then I'll let this marriage happen. And in today's culture, especially now, that's a giant hashtag me too weirdness thing, which again, go listen to that sermon. Again, the Bible's not always prescription, it's description. It's what happened. And so they make this deal. And understandably, the brothers of this woman named Dinah, the brothers, Levi and Simeon, they're not happy. And I can't say that I blame them. I'd be like, yeah, you mess with my sister or anyone for that matter like that. And we're going to throw down a little bit. But these guys go overboard. So Simeon and Levi are sitting there. That whole city gets circumcised. All the men, rather. All the men get circumcised. And I just picture like Levi looking over at Simeon and being like, hey, man, you ever heard the phrase shooting fish in a barrel? Got a whole bunch of men over there. Ain't feeling too good. They could barely walk. I bet you we could take them. And they do. They run into the city. They kill all the men. They take all the women and children, they plunder all of the riches, they take all the livestock, and they totally decimate the area. Genocide, basically. Now, was it wrong what occurred? Yes. Was their response way over the top? Yes. And so it doesn't sit well with Jacob, the dad. He's like, I know this was bad, but what you did was awful. And he says as much in Genesis 34. Then Jacob says to Simeon and Levi, you've brought trouble on me by making me repulsive. In your NIV, it'll say obnoxious. What it's basically saying is like, there's nobody, like no, there's just rules in fighting. When you're fighting with a, a, someone you don't like that much, there's just ways to attack them you don't do. And taking advantage of a whole group of people right after they had what they had done to them, we look disgusting. We don't look holy based upon what you just did. We look repulsive among the inhabitants of the land and among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since my men are few in number, they'll band together and, and, against me and attack me, and I'll be destroyed. I and my household. Then at the end of Jacob's life, just a few chapters later in chapter 34, this is the dad, mind you, he's giving sort of his last will and testament, and he's telling what all the tribes are going to get, and basically telling them what they're going to turn into, and they're going to hear the reasons why they do or don't get a blessing. That would be awful. <laughs> here's why, in, in, my, in my will, here's why you get this. You're a bad kid. <laughs> Ugh. Genesis 49. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Not defense. Violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be the, their anger, so fierce, and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. And all this comes true. Could you imagine hearing that from your father, from a parental figure that you look up to? Hearing them be like, I wouldn't come to you for counsel for anything. You guys are violent and awful. That's the story of Levi and Simeon. So what happens to Simeon? Well, we hear when Moses does the census after they come out of, out of uh, Egypt. So there's hundreds of years after this. They, they come out of Egypt. They, there's a census. Guess which tribe is literally the smallest in number? Simeon's. They never really form back into a tribe. You can see that in Numbers 26. So it comes true for Simeon. In fact, they're all but forgotten in history. But something else happens to the Levites. So how do they go from being virtually forgotten and shamed like the Simeonites to the priests with no land? You see the jump? They were from murderers who their own father wouldn't even go to counsel to being priests and standing up for God. Well, we see it in the story and the account of Moses going up to the mountain. And when he comes back down, you've probably heard the story of the people. They did something bad. They made a golden calf. And they start worshiping it. And they're singing and dancing. And Moses comes down. And I think Josh was there. And he's like, what is that? Is that the sound of war? No, that's the, sing the sound of singing and dancing and worshiping. And what is going on? I mean, this is deplorable. We're like five minutes from crossing the Red Sea. And already they're going back to worshiping false idols. Moses is furious, and rightly so. God, in fact, was furious. He's like, I'll strike them all down. If they can't remember this after five minutes, then no, we're done. And Moses comes down, and this is where we see the hearts of the Levites turn. After hundreds of years, we see them doing a new thing and being a new people. 
This is where they get their new reputation. They fight not out of anger on their own behalf, but for and only when the Lord calls them. Exodus 32, Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughingstock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. What a picture. All right, I need some men to step up. This whole group of people. Oh, look at that. All the Levites. You almost picture everyone else stepping backwards. But these men step up. Then he said to them, this is Moses, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day about 3,000 of the people died. But then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. And again, we've covered this multiple times in this series in Joshua, and if you haven't heard them, I encourage you to go back and listen, but multiple times we've explained how this was the language of the day, that God has the right, he gives life, he can take it away, and this was the language of the day that people would understand But he was also starting something new here with a new people in a new place under a new rule. And he doesn't want it polluted, especially early on at the foundation, with idol worship, with anything that's disgusting. The focus on these formerly cursed people, the Levites, is that they stepped up for the Lord, even against their own family members. They didn't listen to those voices. They listened to his voice. They were willing to stand up and act for the Lord. In these subtle verses in Joshua 20 and 21, we see not only the written account of the crossing of the Jordan, where they left stones to remember, and the establishment of Israel in the promised land. We see stories of redemption. We see wicked and angry people who fought with the weapons of this world leading new lives. We see God's people changing, and they become the keepers of God's temple, the Levites, the priests that become bridge makers to God for their people, intermediaries. And thanks to the grace of God, they no longer desire or needed land because they have God himself. That's their mindset. The Lord was their inheritance. Deuteronomy 18, 2. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised. It wasn't a curse. It was a blessing, a promise. And it was a promise that God kept several times over the last few sermons, I've said the greatest enemy to faith is forgetfulness. We forget what God has done. They would not be forgotten and wiped out, the Levites, but remembered as a people that stood for the Lord alone. They didn't want land. They wanted the Lord. And those Levites, they did not forget how the Lord took them from being shamed to a place of honor. And again, while this is a story of God's people, the book of Joshua in the Old Testament from thousands of years ago, it also parallels with us. Remember, we have a great high priest, Jesus, that died 2,000 years ago for a sinful and selfish people that were only really good at one thing, sinning. That includes you and me. And while they and us could rightly be given a curse, and look at these sinners, our high priest, like in the cities of refuge, died and our past and sins have been forgiven in his eyes. And we're, giving, we're given a new life. And not only are we forgiven, because if I was forgiven of a debt, I would be grateful. But not only are we forgiven, we like the Levites have been wonderfully enlisted and elevated to be what the Bible calls a royal priesthood. Royal, meaning we're in line with the king, and then priesthood, meaning we also uh, are intermediaries to that king. A royal priesthood that doesn't go around hacking people up with swords. Those aren't our orders, but we do have orders. If you're a follower of Christ, we have orders. 1 Peter 2.9, but you, that's us, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him. 
who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our job is a royal priesthood that's been a royal priesthood that's been saved from a checkered and sinful past is to declare the praises of Jesus. That's our job. Not to just live quiet, humdrum, okay lives, but to declare Jesus, declare his praises, the one who pulled us from darkness like the Levites were pulled from darkness. Jesus delivered on his promise, and like the Levites, we should not forget. And Joshua 21 ends with yet another reminder that God keeps his promises. The book that ironically most often gets quoted for our courage and strength is really just a giant list of all the promises that God kept. Joshua 21, 43 through 45. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. I'm going to read that again. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. So my encouragement, my encouragement that not one of the Lord's good promises will fail you. Take refuge in him. Trust in his ways, not your own. Trust in his timing, not yours. Don't do things your way. Listen to him. Lay down the weapons of this world and seek his will in his way. And if you're resisting him in any way, whether it's accepting him or just giving him a part of your life, I just ask, what are you waiting for? What more does he have to do to prove that he is trustworthy? Are you trying to save face or are you trying to find security in the ways of this world? Or do you just not want to be duped? I mean, I ask you, I beg you to consider these questions and to just let go and start trusting God. He promises to forgive, to love, to keep, and even use you. But you have to head to him for refuge. And when we do this, we join the ranks of countless followers of Christ over time who've come before us that can say, the Lord is my inheritance. He promised me, and that's more than enough. I'll pray, and we'll close our time with praising him. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all that you've done, for, for being a place of refuge for us, for establishing us as a people that should be a place of refuge for others. May the people around us See us, Christians, followers of you, as places and people of refuge that they can come to for comfort, support, love, to meet them where they're at. May we be known as a forgiving and kind people. But when we do these things, may people not see us, but see you because we are declaring your praises, that you are good, you are the promise keeper, you did the hard work to save us. All we did was to contribute to our salvation as sin but you are good. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for these promises, for keeping every single one. And thank you for the ones that you will keep. And may you continue to add to our numbers, not for our glory, but for yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.